Um, I can safely say I did not get the job. <laughs> you can pick up right away. And this actually leads me to a point I was hoping to kind of develop on this channel, certainly in this interview series. And basically what the point is, is there's only so much you can do to guarantee your own success. What does this mean? Um, you got to be prepared. You got to dress the part, look the part, come on time, all that stuff. Good resume. Study your resume. You got to know your experience. You got to be prepared for the questions. You got to know what are the questions. Obviously, they're going to ask you why, they, why do you want the job. They're going to ask you about gaps in your resume. That's something very reasonable. You can't get defensive, okay? And just through, like, the questioning line of my interviewer, I don't know if you've ever had this, but she seemed dissatisfied with a lot of my responses. And something I used to do when I was younger, I tried to beef myself up and try to, you know, I'd see they're dissatisfied, so i try to exaggerate, but it doesn't really work. I think sometimes people form ideas about you um, that you have no way of knowing what they are, and it seemed from the way she was asking questions that there was certain information she wanted to get at that I guess I didn't have. So, for example, this was for a front desk agent, so like someone who welcomes the guests, you know, it could even be entry level, they can train you, but I luckily had experience, three years experience, and it just seemed like she would ask about my experience, but she said, oh, was that it? There was this kind of this tone as if that wasn't enough, like she wanted to know about my supervisor experience, and like, and but she was like, oh, so you were just at the front desk, what, what, what else did you want me to do? <laughs> so there was just kind of this tone, um... But you can't read too much into that because I also came across that in France, like the interviews in France feel very cold. And that's just really the interviewer trying to be neutral. Okay? So you may have an interview where the person feels cold or they don't like you, but a lot of times that's them trying to be professional. Obviously, they don't want a lawsuit, they don't want to be accused of, you know, racism or, you know, sexism, all kinds of other isms that are multiplying by the second, it seems. So they might put on a little persona that is kind of like a, you know, someone so, super neutral, almost godlike, you know, doesn't intervene, and it will feel cold, okay? So you can't feel intimidated by that. Uh, but I, I will say, like, I kind of was getting bored. <laughs> and, you know, one thing I don't like is when they have you fill all this paperwork. So they had, you know, three pages of paperwork, want to know about my past employers, phone numbers, addresses. I'm like, um, don't you have the resume for that, right? But, you know, they have their hierarchy. They have, maybe there's legal reasons they have to get it all in writing, but it was quite a waste of time on my, for, for me. Okay, but whatever. Um, so we have the interview. Um, yeah, it's just, I, I don't know. Because I've had interviews where I provide the same examples, the same information, and the interviewer really likes it, okay? Now, one thing to notice is when your interviewer really likes your response, like, oh, that's really good. So, for example, I was talking about a difficult time when there was a power outage at my hotel. And how I talked about some of the stuff I had to do, and, you know, the, it appeared that no guests wanted refunds. And as soon as I said none of the guests wanted a refund, she's like, wow. She was, like, really impressed by that fact. So I guess something that is a big concern for her, right, is, you know, having to give up refunds. That's a big issue they clearly have at the hotel. Um, another thing to look out for is, you know, would you even want to work at the hotel? And to be honest, at this point, I need a job, so I would work at this hotel. But if I had a choice, I wouldn't because I found the front desk was not really up to par. Like, I was the only person in the lobby, and they had me fill up some paperwork, and I was ready, I wanted to hand it in, and I had to stand there for about a minute while they finished up their conversation. Now, the my interviewer, who is the front desk manager, when she, she her back was to me, so she couldn't see me, but when she saw me, she addressed me, but I really don't think it's uh, acceptable. You know, I don't need to hear about the front desk staff talking about the vacation time when there's someone that's... These assistant, assistance. And I did some research on this hotel. I urge you to always do research on your future employer, but don't spend too long because 
if you don't get the job or if you're not liking it, you don't want to waste your time. So I looked at some of the complaints about this place or positive reviews and seemed a lot big uh, issue with customer service. And I definitely picked up on that when I was there. Um, in the interview, you have to pay attention to the things they really hone in on. So for her, a big thing was availability. She, you know, wanted to know if I'd be available if need be to do double shifts. You know, if someone calls in sick, that's a big issue. They need people to work the front desk. Now, that's actually something very alarming. Because, you know, I need a job so I have stable income, right? But the time outside of the job is my time. And I'll probably be too exhausted to do anything. I'll be lucky if I even get to... I mean, I'll definitely compose. Maybe I'll have to shut down the YouTube channel. I hope not. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, my time is very precious, right? So she clearly wanted to... W the best response I would have been able to give for her would be if I were to authentically say, uh, yes, that's not a problem. I don't mind doing double shifts. But I'm... You know, you have to be careful because when you say you're going to be okay with something, then your word is your bond, okay? And it seems like at this hotel, that is a problem. They have people calling in sick, and then the people that are working are expected to double, double shifts. So what does this mean? What it would mean in the hotel industry is if you're working um, 7 to 3, and then the next shift, the night shift from 3 to 11, can't come in, then you're going to be doing... 3 to 11, so you're doing a whole day. No way, Jose! I don't want to do that. Uh, no way, Jose. No way, Jose. Now, I think sometimes they'll get double pay, but, and then she also asked, you know, have you ever worked seven days straight? Oh, that's very scary. I told her, honestly, I don't really remember. I don't think so. Uh, maybe I've worked six days straight. But these things are important to pick up on because the employer is not going to openly say what they're looking for. What they say they're looking for in the job description may not be, it may not be honest, it may be part of what they're looking for, it may be a vaguer manifestation of what they're looking for. So what I saw from her line of questioning is that she wants someone who's going to be very hyper available. In addition, I told her I was not available for Friday mornings and she said, well, basically said like, would you be okay working Friday mornings if we had to put you in the schedule? So I said, yes, fine, okay. Because I do want Friday mornings reserved when I do a live series where I'll be playing, performing music live. It's not every Friday, but I do want it Fridays at 12. So I just want that available. Um, so it was a concern for me that I would be working here thinking, okay, I have stability. And then all of a sudden I have to work um, double shifts. Okay. And it, that's definitely something that was an issue. Okay. Uh, sorry, this camera does not want to function. Um, other things. So I definitely just didn't feel like I was, you know, there was one other thing, um, there was one other thing I said where she was really impressed, but it was something I didn't think was that impressive. So I, I don't know. So she was obviously looking for certain things that I didn't have. And I think at a certain point, you just need to accept that, you know. You don't have to force things, okay. I came prepared. Now, one thing that was very illuminating was like kind of at the end, the interview stopped. And she, we just was talking, I was talking about living in France, and she asked, this is like the informal part when the interview is talking to over. But as you're going to see very shortly, the interview is never over. And so she asked about the teaching stuff, you know, teaching in France, and she saw very quickly that my eyes lit up. <laughs> yeah, people see when you get inspired, and like, I love teaching when I, you know, I do think I never had a really ideal situation teaching. You know, I was never able to work full time as a teacher or to have really the peace of mind to invest fully into the teaching. You know, I was always like, you know, going to school and other stuff. But when she was just asking, like, oh, what was it like to teach in France? She saw my eyes light up. And we had a good conversation. I was telling her about the difficulties of working with kids 
and kind of even at the very end, you know, at the end, when we separate, she's like, oh, well, I wish you luck in teaching, basically saying, like, <laughs> you didn't get the job. No, she didn't, it wasn't like that. But this is something to keep in mind, is one of the difficulties in getting a job as a classical artist is, you know, they're going to see at some point it's not your passion and you have to find a good reason. And like my official thing was like, you know, there's no work. Um, I do enjoy working with people, but they may ask you other questions, not seeming related to the job to get information. Now, I think she was just honestly just asking just in a conversational manner because the interview was officially over. But still, the interview is still going on, right? And she definitely saw the way I talked, the animation. We actually stayed and talked for like maybe 10 minutes. Just She was talking about like movie, just moved to Jersey. We had a nice conversation. And very interestingly enough, this nice conversation was way more enjoyable than the interview. And I, I've had that a number of times with interviewers where the interview just feels really strained. I definitely got defensive at one point because um, she asked a question about a difficult time. Uh, with a coworker, and I explained I had a difficulty training someone and they didn't want to take any orders, didn't want to listen, ultimately I had to bring the attention to the manager. And then she said, oh, so do you always go to the manager? Basically implying that I'm someone who doesn't like to resolve things. So I got a little defensive there, you know. I, I didn't show too, too overtly, but um, I gave other examples. But, you know, people interpret your information in many different ways. So the same piece of information that I would have given to someone else, they may interpret in a positive way. Okay? So again, your interviewer, it's... <laughs> you have to show up, you have to be ready, you have to be ready to play ball. Um, generally, when I do get jobs outside of music, miss my jobs, the interviewer is someone who has an interest in music. I, I didn't know why that is, but that's one of the reasons I don't even bother hiding the music from the resume. I will put, you know, for the, for the college, you know, where I went to college, I will put masters in music composition, bachelors in music composition. Um, I don't see, try to hide it. Even in the, um, the objective part, um, I say in this one, I recently returned after five years of in Paris, I was studying classical music. So I just like to have it on the table because I have found that the employers that do give me a shot and see my unique potential are ones that always like either they were former musicians or they have friends that have musicians, they're a family member, they're musicians. They always, it's something um, they find very beautiful. And actually one of the wonderful things about in France is that actually helped me. Is when I said I was composer, like, oh, ça c'est magnifique, ça c'est beau. Um, definitely, I can't show you right now, but what's supporting the phone, I have the score for Beethoven's 5th, um, 6th, and 7th symphonies, which is a no-no, don't bring that to the interview. But I brought it, okay? And in France, that's definitely the, oh, wow. So I think the moral of the story is, um, yes, there is one strategy to hide the things that you think are going to be detrimental to your candidature, okay? But there's also, it's just easier to be yourself, and hopefully at some point you find someone who recognizes that, recognizes that you have something special, and then you get the job.